Sehr vielen Dank erstmal, Herr Knigge, für den Vortrag. Ich werde jetzt meinen Vortrag auf Englisch halten und dann bei der Diskussion werden wir wieder ins Deutsche gehen. Aber Sie haben ja alle Übersetzungen, insofern kein Problem. So I will switch now to English. And I would like to first thank the organizers of the conference for inviting me. And before I begin, I would also like to emphasize that the paper I'm going to present is work in progress of a team. That is myself and my brilliant colleague, Patricia Piberga, who is also sitting here in the first row. We have drafted this paper together. The paper itself is also collective work in a broader sense, as it is born out of countless conversations with scholars here in Berlin primarily, Sultan Dugan, Nahid Samo, and Sami Khatib. All of us follow recent memory debates as part of a longer term analysis of the recurring repetitive debates that shape our works and lives in, in the city. These are debates related to the representation of the German state, the making and marketing of its collective self, its implied blank spaces, premises and occlusions. Based on these long term conversations and observations, What I and Patricia would like to address today is not straightforwardly the use or misuse of memory. Rather, the very fact that memory debates serve as arenas in which political conflicts of the present are acted out. What is this close merging between the present and the memorization of the past doing? This question grows out of our suspicion regarding the often voiced desired ideal of recent memory debates. According to this ideal, colonial pasts can and have to be recognized without competing with or relativizing the memory of the Holocaust and its pivotal importance for German political culture and collective self-understanding. While intuitively appealing, we suggest that such a desired pluralization of this liberal or cosmopolitan memory paradigm ultimately leads to a recognition of more victims, yet it occludes an understanding of political conflicts as political conflicts and delegates the political primarily to the sphere of morality. In this talk, I will therefore approach victimhood as an analytical category and first briefly describe the genealogy of the figure of the victim. I will then carve out the centrality of the figure of the Jewish victim, specifically the revived, resurrected, resilient and vibrant victim for the making of the German post-war order. I will close with three, three brief examples that demonstrate how the politics of victimhood in this specific German context enables the recognition of more victims, yet simultaneously reproduces a hierarchization of vulnerability. So let me begin. The German term Opfer originates in the Latin sacrificium or victima. These two Latin terms have distinct meanings. Sacrificium designates an active sacrifice, for example, the offering of an animal to a deity or the voluntary renunciation from certain acts. Victima designates a passive enduring of, sufferance, of suffering caused by natural catastrophe or violence. Whereas the German Opfer entails both of these meanings, the English sacrifice victim and the French sacrifice victim differentiate between them. Only later, Opfer is detached from its theological context and enters the sphere of ethics as well as historical and political philosophy. With the emergence of the modern nation state in the middle of the 18th century, the term's currency increases, culminating in its association with heroic self-sacrifice for the homeland. Beginning in the 19th century, essential social trans transformations occur in European societies which have lasting effects on the notion of passive victimhood. In particular, perception of violence and war change fundamentally. This is a result of the identification and documentation of fallen soldiers during World War I and the claims for compensation that bereaved families or wounded and disabled survivors now demand. 
However, it is only with the end of World War II and the gradual emergence of the processes of coming to terms with the Nazi crimes that the figure of the victim turns into one of the most potent figures of political culture and memory politics. This figure is now implicated in a shift from the future-oriented model of progress to the past-oriented model of memory, as Martin Sabro puts it. Historian Martin Schulz Wessel speaks of the victimization of his historical science and political discourse, and Peter Halama attests to Western Europe's passive turn from national heroic narratives to an age of victimhood filled with guilt and shame. Quote, yesterday's victimization is becoming the legitimacy of today's claims, end quote. Especially since the 90s, the notion that victim experiences constitute identities gains increasing popularity, and self-identification as a victim accordingly morphs into a common mode of self-description in confrontation with individual or group violence. Also beyond the specific context of World War II, medical discourses and media representation since the 1980s contribute to a growing popularization of victim narratives. Psychotherapeutically oriented researchers emphasize how identities are being formed through experiences of suffering. The medical discovery of trauma as a post-traumatic stress disorder, its legal codification and pop cultural restaging further propel the dissemination and expansion of the rhetoric of victimhood. At the same time, the newly created criminological subdiscipline of victimology describes, in addition to primary and secondary, also tertiary victimization, and thus integrates and fixates victimhood as a central component of a personality, a subject, position, or an identity. Far beyond the experience of violence in the context of war and persecution, victimhood is now inscribed primarily into the physical body and codified as well as eternalized as a biologically and culturally inheritable painful experience. Towards the end of the 20th century, the emphatic identification as or with victims increasingly turns into a practice firmly anchored in Western and Central European societies. Relatedly, state recognition of collective victimhood becomes key in struggles over political representation. States now establish frameworks within which minoritized groups are placed and place themselves into relations of competition and solidarity alongside their respective victimary identities. State recognition of victimhood can, in this sense, also be understood as an instrumentum regni, as some put it, constituting and organizing groups around their victimi victimary identities and experiences. However, now that a moralized rhetoric of victimhood becomes politically efficient, also global state powers describe themselves as potential victims. The post-1989 order conceptualizes its military inventions, in inventions and interventions as a defense of the moral order of the West and against its own potential victimization. Whereas various political struggles previously played out on the basis of different visions of the political order, such as communism versus market capitalism, they are now discussed and framed as struggles between parties with moral and immoral dispositions. In this moment, deviance is no longer described as political antagonism, but as a reluctance to emphatically identify with the suffering of others. Let me now turn to the figure of the Jewish victim. During the first decades after 1945, the West German state ignores, marginalizes, and blames Jews and all those murdered for their categorization as Jews under the Nazi regime in its practices of restitution and political discourses. Social scientist Jean-Michel Chaumont meticulously traces how these renewed experiences of humiliation, shame, and frustrated demands for recognition inscribe themselves into Jews' collective consciousness. Only gradually, especially in the wake of the broadcasting of the Eichmann trial and the popularization of the term Holocaust through the same name TV series, the systematic mass murder of Jews 
becomes recognized as a catastrophe in and of itself, rather than as collateral damage of excessive warfare. In West Germany, the emergence of civil memory activism, the Geschichts- und Gedenkstättenbewegung, and a growing interest in the historiography of the Holocaust constitute the first public attempts to come to terms with the Nazi past, and in particular, its policy of extermination. Individual and collective self-formation now becomes increasingly entangled with the gaze towards the past. Turning away from the self-victimization of their parents, the second generation identifies with its parents' victims and desires the figure of the felt victim, as Ulrike Jureit calls it. Such identification with victims has both an identity establishing and exonerating function. Media enactments of powerless victims further promote idealized substitute identities that enable the German audience to distance itself from perpetrators. Identification specifically with the Holocaust Jewish victims and mourning morph into basic elements of remembrance and begin to determine political and aesthetic commemorative practices and discourses. Victimhood becomes a desired resource and an asset in the context of memory politics and activism of the 1980s, first tensions arise between groups that define themselves in relation to their victimization by the NS regime. Jean-Michel Chaumont describes how, during the first years after the war, politically persecuted victims are addressed as heroic resistance fighters who are honored for what they did, namely resisting. Gradually, however, when innocence and passivity become central characteristics attached to victimhood, the racially persecuted outcompete, so to say, the politically persecuted. In a now emerging ranking of suffering, Jews as nonpartisan and apolitical victims who were killed for no other reason than who they are, are inscribed as paradigmatic victims. An inversion that has to be understood also in the context of the Cold War, of course. Under the premises of the nation formation of what is today subsumed under the rubric of identity politics, the notion of innocent, passive victimhood is thus increasingly inscribed into the figure of the Jew. After 1989, when seeking to demonstrate its stable and full belonging to the realm of civilized nation, nations, the new German state, institutionalizes the memory of the Holocaust as, as its so-called post-national foundation. In this context, it is the revived figure of the Jew that becomes the key figure of German democratic self-assertion and the medium through which the very identity of the Berlin Republic is articulated and demonstrated. Standing in for everything the Nazi state was not, the figure of the Jew becomes a desired figure upon which hopes for a post-national, post-racial future are projected. Jewish museums, memorial sites, Jewish culture days, various Israel-related initiatives and events, countless movies and books, all become sites upon which a democratic, liberal, tolerant disposition is made public and experienced. Things Jewish, now inform the subjectivities and political emotions of those who conceive of themselves as the participative carriers of a new democratic German political consciousness and collectivity. The democratic citizen and the figure of the Jew are imagined sharing one and the same moral political space. And thereby, new Germany becomes an identifiable nation as well as a nation one can identify with. Especially the performance of Holocaust memory and the corresponding institu institutionalization and expansion of Holocaust education now becomes a prerequisite of moral belonging. The dividing line between the genocidal past and the purified present is drawn and made visible both on the level of political discourse and individual citizens' practices through the performance, or the pequentness maybe, of a shift from a world in which the German state remembered its killed Jews to a world in which it actively protects its living Jews. For the Federal Republic of Germany and its civil society, the maintenance of a special relationship with the State of Israel, the establishment of a representative victim-identified culture of remembrance, 
the normative commitment to support whatever is framed as a support of Jewish life and the combat of whatever is framed as a combat of anti-Semitism are thus fundamental. The paradigmatic iconic weight of the figure of the resurrected, now resilient Jewish victim has implications for the desired project of pluralization in memorial contexts and ultimately it impacts the way that present-day political struggles are read and acted out. The centrality of Jewish victimhood implies that vulnerability can be principally recognized only if it does not compete with the figure of the Jew or relativizes its victim status in the present. Political violence against minoritized subjects and collectives for whom West German rehabilitation is not central for their self-constitution remains illegible. Regardless of whether or not the Holocaust was historically unique, an embrace of this specific lesson to draw from the past sends an essential condition of moral belonging. The figure of the Jewish victim can activate awareness and prevent some form, forms of violence, yet, is yet it is simultaneously implicated in the production of moral others. In this sense, the moralization of political discourse also constitutes the breeding ground of political subjectivation. For example, since the reforms of German citizenship law in 1999-2000, the Ausländer or Türke is replaced by a Muslim collective subject. Especially since 9-11, this new collective body is monitored as a potential threat to liberal demo democratic culture writ large and to Jewish existence in particular. Concepts such as political Islam, Muslim antisemitism, Gefährder, and Hassprediger find entrance into media, political, as well as academic discourse and law. The vulnerability of this collective subject is contested as New Germany associates it with the kind of pastness that materializes both in a pre-modern, non-enlightened, illiberal religiosity and an antagonistic relation to Jews. Forever suspicious, this collective body is hence in perpetual need to demonstrate its liberal democratic and anti-antisemitic disposition. It has to be constantly educated. Another example. After 89, the unification of the two German states, a collective East German subject is inscribed as deficient in its democratic dispositions and coming to terms with the Nazi past. It still has to catch up. Its democ democracy is in diapers, its revolution nachgeholt, and its conception of history in dire need of education. As a result, right-wing violence and attitudes are understood as symptoms of an inadequate Vergangenheitsbewältigung, rather than as phenomena that, has to be anal that have to be analyzed as part of a much broader spectrum of disidentification with the Berlin Republic and its governance. By relegating racism, anti-Semitism and right-wing violence to a past which the East German collective has not yet purged from its midst, New Germany thus constitutes, it constitutes itself as a purified, now tolerant and liberal democracy. The ubiquity of right-wing and racist structures in federal East and West German state institutions from polis, military and political parties to Verfassungsschutz is thereby obfuscated. A last example. Especially over the past decade, the gaze of German public discourse in its political, media, educational and academic manifestations is directed at Palestinians uh, as a collective that requires special monitoring. Fostered by the emergence of the concept of Israel-related antisemitism and its implementation in political practice, the Palestinian collective's body is inscribed as ontologically antisemitic until proven otherwise. Palestinians, in this sense, are collateral damage of the intensifying German wish for purification from anti-Semitism. This to an extent that in recent times, the very signifier, Palestine, increasingly becomes an accessible, internalized and viral trope denoting anti-Semitism. The birth of a morally improved German polity made of citizens who have learned their lesson and now wish to protect what their ancestors failed to protect, goes along an inscription of Palestinians as perpetrators and of Jews as their victims. For it is Jewish vulnerability now as concrete reality and discursive trope 
that enables the carriers of new Germany to experience the present as a new era in which someone else endangers Jews. In a field structured by Germany's collective moral conversion from genocidal nationalism to liberal and allegedly different and best embracing democracy, the figure of the revived, resurrected and resilient Jewish victim that now requires protection, especially in its statist form, is not innocent. Following, following up on these brief examples, I close with a questioning of the politics of victimhood. I observe that the struggles of the present and political subjectivation are tightly bound to the constitution and recognition of past victimhood. Memorization promises the prevention of catastrophes to ever occur again. Yet my impression is that this merging of past and present empirically does not prevent catastrophes. Even though we hold tight to the promises of the figure of the victim, it thus seems urgent to analyze this figure itself and our attachment to it. For if the visibility of contemporary injustices remains bound to the recognition of past victimhood, then the best way to address injustice now is to build a memorial for those still precariously alive. And this may not be the best of options. Thank you.